Welcome to the Red Door Church Sermon Podcast. Red Door Church is a church seeking to transform the city of Pretoria by the power of the gospel. We are distinctly mission-minded, community-cultivating, and city-loving. Please enjoy this week's sermon, and don't forget to follow and continue the conversation by sharing with those around you. Um, well done, Zane and Tuki, for reading that marathon right there. Um, friends, welcome again as Temba. Welcome to you guys this morning. My name is Haranki, so Reinhardt. I'm the pastor here at Red Door Church. And wow, what a morning it's already been. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we're in a series in the book of Acts. And this morning is the end, is the series finale of series one. And so to this morning is the end of this series of uh, series number one. And we're going to take a break from the book of Acts and we're going to dive next week in some psalms, some prayers for Pretoria. And so if you're joining us for the first time this morning, you've joined us for a humdinger. It's going to be a big one. Like you guys saw the one that we read. It's really good. I don't know about you, but it already feels like I've had a big feast this morning. Man, what a morning it's been. I never knew that uh, Connor and uh, Cranker had such active Acting talent. I mean, they've been hiding that pretty well. Selen, so encouraging, sharing this morning through the prayers and the reading. Uh, hearts already been really warm this morning. But we do pray that even now, as we're going to dive into this lengthy text, and don't worry, my sermon won't be as long as Stephen's sermon in the text. Um, but we do pray that as we navigate this massive and amazing text this morning, that God would use that to also change our hearts and to turn our hearts to Him. For that, a lot has been said and a lot has been prayed. I'll pray quickly, but we need prayer for our hearts as well this morning. So let me pray for us. Father God, uh, oh, how we wish that we could meet in person. Uh, but if not, this is a close second. Uh, it's, it's really great to be able to see our brothers and sisters on the screen. And we pray this morning that there would be unity, not through only the medium of Zoom, but actually through the unity of your Spirit. And we actually, we're so thankful that our hearts are already warmed this morning. And we pray for more of that. May we be convicted. May we be encouraged. May we be excited by your word and your gospel through your spirit. Amen. Family, it's, it's uncanny how in times of serious crisis, most people will try and look for God, whether you're a Christian or not. We see this in movies, we see this in real life, that uh, when your life is in danger, or when you're facing life-threatening situations, people will seek comfort in a higher being. It doesn't matter who you are. The only difference between people is where they look for God. Some people look for God when they seek out a, a man of the cloth to pray for them or a priest to pray for them. Uh, some people have physical things that they try to hold on to. Maybe you've got a crucifix or some prayer beads or something that makes you feel closer to God. Some people would even visit a special religious heritage site so that they can feel closer to God. So they would go on some sort of pilgrimage to some of these special places so that they can feel close to God or they can make their requests known to God. And so that maybe poses a question for us this morning. What do you do to get close to God? Or at least to feel close to God? Where do you turn to? What are some of the things that you run to that makes you already feel that much closer to God? If you were a Jew, or if you are a Jew this morning, the answer is pretty simple. You would go to the temple. Um, now today, the temple is largely destroyed in the city of Jerusalem. However, in Jerusalem, the one wall of the temple remains. It's called the Western Wall or the Wall of Wailing. And millions of people every year visit this special religious site uh, to pray to God. And they somehow believe if they're at that special site, at the temple, they're, they're closer to God or God would somehow hear their prayers. And so the temple in the Jewish tradition is of great spiritual significance, even today for a lot of people, whether you're Jewish or not. And it certainly played a major role in the Jewish faith back then when the temple was still restored. And so the question that we need to answer ourselves or that we need to wrestle with this morning is we think about that. You know, does it really help? 
Uh, does it really help to go to these special religious sites or do these religious artifacts actually bring us closer or not closer to God this morning? Do we still need the temple? or How can we actually get close to God? Where are the places or what are the things that we need to turn to if we need to look for God, especially in a time like today? And especially in times of crises like a pandemic, where do we turn to when we look to God, when we want to connect with God? My fam, that's what today's passage is all about, the massive passage that we're going to dive into. Um, just to bring us up to speed of where we are in the book of Acts, uh, the church was started by Jesus and through his spirit, by the apostles. And what we've seen in the first couple of chapters is just amazing and a major growth in the church. Definitely revival. Hundreds and thousands of people coming to faith. And what we saw last week is that suddenly we had all these people. And you had this great need and we needed to look after the people in the church. And so more structure was needed in the church. And so the apostles appointed seven men that they called deacons to help serve the church so that they could keep the main thing, the main thing, which is obviously the ministry of the word. If you missed that sermon, it's on the website. Uh, Temba preached an absolute fire sermon. You've got to go listen to it. Now, of these seven men appointed to serve as deacons in the church, as they kind of structured the church, one of these individuals was called Stephen. Now, the text tells us a little bit more about who and what Stephen is. He was a man full of wisdom, full of grace and power, and definitely full of the Spirit, meaning that the Spirit, he had a, spirit, a specific gifting where the Spirit was guiding him and helping him and teaching him how to preach and teach. And what we see is that Stephen wasn't just serving in the church, he was also proclaiming the gospel. Um, he was sharing it with the people in the synagogue. And the teachers of the Jewish faith, often in the synagogue, came and wrestled with Stephen, uh, with, Stephen with um, you know, debating with them and actually bringing some arguments against him. And the text said that they could not withstand his wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking, which is amazing. <laughs> you had these scholars that weren't able to actually disprove everything that Stephen was teaching. And what do people do when they don't get their own way? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, they, they cheat, they instigate, and they lie. And so we see that these teachers in the synagogue, they weren't going to let Stephen get away with this. And so they instigated men of ill repute to come and bring false accusations against Stephen, to bring false charges against Stephen. And ultimately, these charges led to Stephen being arrested. And he had to, be, and he had to appear before the council of the synagogue. This is the same council that first arrested Peter and John. This is the same council that arrested all the apostles and had them beaten. This is the same council that sentenced Jesus to death. And so the charge is brought against Stephen. And you can already uh, realize this is pretty serious if you're appearing before the Sanhedrin, before this council. But the charges that were brought against Stephen were so serious that he... Um, had to appear before this council and the charges were twofold or the accusation that was brought against him was twofold first he was accused of speaking against the temple their holy place and secondly the second charge that was brought against him is that he was against the law of Moses and because Stephen was preaching and teaching about Jesus, it sounded like Jesus was taking away the law of Moses. It, it sounded like Jesus was saying that the temple was insignificant. And Stephen, being an advocate for Jesus and standing for everything that Jesus taught and spoke about, it obviously then meant that Stephen was also against the temple and against the law of Moses. Now, these are pretty serious accusations that were brought against Stephen. And to understand his response, the speech that he gave to the council, we need to know what this meant in Jewish and Old Covenant tradition. Uh, here's why it's important. I'm going to read for us an extract from Exodus 34 verse 19. Jason's going to put it up on the screen. It says that um, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of testimony in his hand. As he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. 
Thanks for that, Jason. God spoke directly with Moses, and he gave Moses his law and his word. Now, as evidence that it wasn't simply Moses going up to a mountain and making up his own law, um, we see that Mesa, or, or we read that Moses' face shone because he was conversing with God. Moses and the subsequent Mosaic law, as it's called, is God's word to his people and therefore represents God's rule over his people. To reject the law, or even to reject, to speak evil against Moses, was to directly reject God and his good rule over his people. This, of course, is blasphemous and the punishment of this is death. The temple, on the other hand, was equally significant and important. The temple was the permanent replacement for the tabernacle, the, the tent of meeting that was given to the Israelites by Moses whilst they were in the wilderness. This was the first place given to God's people where they could bring sacrifices as prescribed by this Mosaic law. And in this space, in the innermost room, was a place called the Holy of Holies. Now the high priest could only go once a year into these Holy of Holies to do and go make sacrifices for the people of God to atone for their sins, to go into God's presence. And so the temple, especially back then, was much more than just a place that they used to worship God. The temple symbolized God's presence. And in a very real way, it was the place where God was present amongst his people. So just in kingdom language, if God is the king of Israel, his word is his law and his rule over his kingdom. And the temple represents his presence and the place where he executes that good rule. And so when we understand this, we realize how the accusations against Stephen wasn't just arbitrary accusations. No, he was accused of going and speaking against the kingdom of God. This is the biggest form of blasphemy that exists. And the penalty under Jewish law, as we mentioned, is death. And so when Stephen is brought before the council, we read in verse 15, and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I don't know if you guys picked that up. Stephen's face was shining. Now, this is no accident. It wasn't a light that accidentally shone on Stephen right there. No, it was God showing his approval of Stephen in that moment. It was God saying that whatever Stephen was going to say right now, whatever speech that Stephen was going to give, it was carrying God's approval. In the same way that God spoke to Moses and Moses' face shone, we now see that Stephen is God's representative and he's going to make known God's will to the council. Especially as we reflect back on this, we see that this is not some new revelation that's being brought forward. No, whatever Stephen is going to say now is part of God's word, his revealed will to us today. This is an allusion back to Moses. This is God putting his seal of approval on Stephen's speech. Nevertheless, even though the council saw this, they were probably a little bit bewildered. Um, they were undeterred. And they still wanted to get to the bottom line of what's been going on. And they started to interrogate Stephen and ask him if these charges, these two main charges against him were true or not. And what follows is... Um, Stephen's speech. And as far as speeches go, this one is pretty long. And we can get lost in the details of the speech. However, we have a roadmap. We know that Stephen isn't just giving a random speech. He isn't just giving a random explanation of the gospel. No, Stephen is specifically answering their questions. Are you speaking against God's word, the law, and Moses? And are you blaspheming against God's presence, the temple? And so Stephen goes ahead in answering this by referring to specific events in the history of Israel. And he does this in four big movements, four time periods characterized by four main characters that will make Stephen's point on how Jesus is not only not going against the temple and not going against the law, but actually, actually all of history, the whole history of Israel has been pointing and leading up to Jesus. 
And so what we're gonna do right now, we're quickly gonna look at these four time periods and we're gonna see how Stephen ties them together and how it shows and what revelation it actually shows us about Jesus Christ. And so just quickly, you don't have to make, if you're making notes, these, these are the four time periods. You get the time of the patriarchs, which is the time of Abraham. We see the time of exile to Egypt. That's the time of Joseph. Then we see the time of, or, or the Exodus and the Mosaic law. That's the time of Moses. And finally, we see the kingdom period, the time of David and Solomon. And so Stephen runs through these four big major periods in Israel's history. Massive movements to one, make one major point. And so don't miss this as we go through these four points. This is the point that Stephen wants to make. God's sovereignty, his rule, and his presence has never been limited to a place or a time or a people. When we look at the history of Israel, we see that God's sovereignty, his rule, has never been limited to a time or a place or a people. We see in Abraham that God made his covenant promise to Abraham when he was still uh, an idol worshiper. He was actually a moon worshiper. And so what we learn through that time period, especially the time of the patriarchs, is that God's goodness and his promise did not rest on the faithfulness of Abraham, but it was rather dependent on God's own goodness. We see in the time of Joseph and the exile to Egypt that even amongst the most broken situation possible, the broken world and people sin interfering with seemingly God's promises that he made to the patriarchs that all things still work together for God's good purpose. God will execute his plan and he will execute his judgment in spite of what the nations do, in spite of people's sin. In spite of brokenness, God's will will be accomplished. And we see in Moses a type of Messiah. We see God using Moses to lead his people out of slavery and to the promised land. Not only that, but Moses was to give guidance to the people on how to serve and love God. And so being a prophet and a type of Messiah, we see that Moses, in Moses, that even Moses was time and time rejected, just like the future Messiah will be time and time rejected by his own people. We see that people turned away from Moses, turned away from this Messiah, and were rather turned to other gods to try and save them. They will serve false gods and turn away from the one true living God. And finally, kind of in this kingdom period, we see that when Israel at long lost, um, through the exile, through the exodus, through the wilderness, once they enter the promised land, we see that the, the kings and the hope of the kingdom restored. The hope of a kingdom where God will rule through the chosen king. And so everyone was hoping, is this the time? Is this finally the time where we're going to enjoy a place where we can worship God? Where we can enjoy God's rule and where we can finally enjoy God's presence in the temple? Surely it should be in David. They hoped it would be David. But even David wasn't enough. There was so much blood on David's hands that he wasn't chosen to build God's temple. It was given to Solomon, his son. And then people were hoping, well, maybe in Solomon now, maybe at long last, now all the promises of God will find their yes in Solomon. And yet, even when the temple was completed by King Solomon in all its glory and splendor, we read and remember in verse 48, The Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne. And earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So what, what Stephen is showing us is that God has been working. God has been saving throughout the whole Old Testament. He's been drawing people closer to him, yet because of sin. Constantly, the people of God never get to fully enjoy the perfect rule or presence of God. Sin always gets in the way. They're never fully there. They're never fully experiencing. The promise is never fully met. It's as if the whole of Israel's history is left unfinished. It's full of 
unmet expectations of what it would be like, of what you would picture it to be like to live under the kingship of, kingship of Yahweh God. And we have to ask ourselves why. Why is the old covenant, why is the old testament story unfinished? What is missing? And the answer, of course, and the answer that Stephen is clearly alluding to is because the story wasn't finished yet. The main character hasn't arrived on the scene yet. Yes, God has already been working. Yes, he has been calling people to himself, making himself known, but it's been a progressive revelation, building up to the ultimate story of redemption. Everything thus far has been very real to the people in Israel, but they've been shadows. It's been illusions pointing to the one true king to come. The Exodus... The exile, the promised land, the kings, all shadows of what is to come. And so God reveals it ultimately, that all of these promises, everything was pointing and finding their yes in Jesus Christ. We read in John 1 that Jesus is the Word. Jesus is God's rule and His authority. He is the true King that is executing God's rule. Jesus is the new temple. He is the embodiment of God's presence. Those who have seen Jesus have seen the Father. There is no fuller representation of God than Jesus. The accusation that the council leveled against Stephen, he now turns back to them. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. It's quite interesting. Stephen is the one on trial. But even in his speech, in his sermon, he turns the trial around and he shines the light on them. He turns the mirror on them so that they could see that the accusation that they leveled against Stephen is actually the accusation against their own hearts. If they really did believe in the law of Moses... If they really did serve God with all their heart, they would have recognized the king in Jesus. Yet, they killed him and rather chose to cling to the religious artifacts. They might have been circumcised, bearing the outward marks of the covenant that God gave them, but inwardly, their hearts, they were far from God, far from serving him with their hearts. That's why Stephen calls them, you uncircumcised in heart. They were so interested in preserving the religious system that they missed the God to whom all of this was pointing to. And so family, this morning, we, we, we cannot hear this this morning and miss the opportunity to search our own hearts to make sure that we are not those stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts. Is there anything that we hold on to that we somehow might think will get us closer to God other than Jesus? Is there something that we believe can give us that extra spiritual juice that will just put us or give us better protection than the people around us? Even if we don't rely on those things for salvations, what are those things that we constantly need to do or that we constantly do that we feel better about ourselves? We need to evaluate our hearts to make sure that we are securely and daily rooted in the truth of the gospel so that we don't drift. Naturally, all of us tend to drift. And that happens. But let's do the litmus test to our hearts to make sure that we get back on course. If you think about ships and how they navigate, especially before GPS systems, what people would normally do, they would either take um, stars or for the sun to get coordinates or to get a heading of where they should go. And so what people would do is they navigate on ships as they would get a heading and then they would set sail. And then a couple of hours later or maybe later in the day, you would get another heading and then you would correct the ship's course based on that heading. The more you do this, the more you get your heading, the less you have to correct the ship's course. But if you take a long time to find a heading again, the amount that you might have drifted, it seems insignificant at the beginning, but the more time we let go, the further we drift from the truth. The farther we are away from our original heading. That's why we need to constantly check our hearts. 
to make sure that Jesus and the gospel is the only thing that we hold on to when we look for God. Now I know we, we're actually pretty different from the original audience and from the original Jewish faith. We don't have these very real things like the temple and the law that they were depending on to get them closer to God. And we might not even be like other Christian traditions that have more traditional worship experiences that you might feel closer to God. However, we still have our own things that we can do that prones us to wander away from the gospel. It might be even our view on baptism. Whether you're of the conviction that children should only be baptized or adults should be baptized, many people fall into the trap thinking that baptism in itself is some sort of fire insurance. That um, I'm not really sure what I believe on baptism, but I just want to get baptized so I can have something extra. It might be even your view on a church gathering or on a physical church building, thinking that when you, once you're in that space, you're somehow more acceptable to God. It might be that you think that a pastor's prayer is more effectual than another sister or brother's prayer or even your own prayer. It might even be when you sin or when you mess up that you think that you need to punish yourself or that you need to pay some sort of price so that you can get back to God again. It might even be, and we still see this so often, that people are grabbing or clinging to physical signs so that they can get close to God. It might even be why we're so infatuated by the idea that we want to anoint things with oil. And again, hear me this morning. All of the things that I've mentioned, nothing is wrong within itself. But it's when we use those things that we think that can get us closer to God. It's only once I've anointed myself or my house that I somehow feel extra covered. A little bit extra piece of God that I can get. And I think some of, some of us kind of approach this thing, and th this was me for the longest time, where I'm not really sure what I believe about this, but it probably won't hurt to get some a little bit of extra protection. I just want to do something Christian-y so that I feel better about myself. It can't be bad for me, and what it might do is might give me some sort of extra blessing. Maybe if I listen to that specific song, or maybe if I pray in this specific way, maybe if I pray longer or use these specific words, I might get that extra blessing. I might be closer to God than I was before. Surely, this can't hurt. Uh, no family, it can. In fact, doing these things without understanding how God has give, given and gifted them as gifts to the church can actually have a serious negative effect on our relationship with God because we're missing out on a relationship. And we, we're treating God like some sort of genie or potion where we need to say the right words, we need to do the right things in order for Him to bless us. Much like the Pharisees, if we do that, we're in serious danger of missing the main character. All these things, although good things and gifts given to the God, like communion, like baptism, like the gathering of the saints, like corporate prayer, like fasting, all of these things have been gifts given to the church, but the main purpose of everything has been to point back to the main character, to shine the light on Jesus Christ. If we use those things for an end within itself, we might miss the plot. When we get superstitious, it's actually dangerous because we move away from trusting in the work and the blood and the atonement of Christ and we start trusting in these things by themselves, nullifying the effect of the cross. Family, Jesus is everything. There's no special prophecy, apostle, audible voice that we need to hear. There's no special oil that you need to have. There's no special song or feeling that you need to hear or experience before you can confidently say that all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are caught up in Jesus. And if I have Him, I have everything. Now, how do we know this? How do we know that we can have all these spiritual blessings in Christ and that He freely bestows it upon us, especially in times like this when I don't feel like it? 
We even prayed about this this morning before the service. A lot of us, we don't feel holy right now. I don't feel like I'm close to God like now. I don't even feel like I'm experiencing Him right now. So how can I be sure without doing something extra that I am actually close to God? What is our guarantee this morning, family? Well, read how the story ends this morning. When they heard this sermon, you can imagine sitting in that courtroom and Stephen turning the accusation back on these religious leaders. The text says they grinded their teeth. They grabbed Stephen and dragged him out of the city. Now remember, they actually need permission from the Romans to kill Stephen, but they didn't care. Their true colors were showing. The moment their false god was exposed, they were cut by Stephen's words. And what they were bleeding instead of grace and forgiveness and repentance, they were hungry for revenge and blood. They've drifted too long for too far to recognize the truth. And they stoned Stephen. As they stoned him, Stephen made these two remarks in verses 59 and 60. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Family, do these words sound familiar? These were the exact words that Jesus spoke before he died on the cross for our sins. When Stephen was physically cut by the stones, he bled grace and forgiveness. Stephen was captured by Jesus and only Jesus and he saw Jesus standing next to God ready to welcome him into his kingdom. How do we know Jesus is enough? Well, at one stage or another all of us were in that crowd hurling insults, sitting approving of all of this like Saul. Yes, he needs to be stoned and yet Jesus had all the authority and the will to forgive us through his blood. Jesus also spoke those words, Father, do not hold this against them. And so this morning, I'm not sure if you've experienced this yet, if if you actually know this yet, but Jesus wants to forgive you. He chooses to do so, but we need to accept this from him and only him. Only like Stephen staring into the heaven and seeing only Jesus, nothing else. It is this single-minded dependence on Christ that will change us, that will make us into the being and be able to suffer and give glory to Christ like a Stephen, so that when we get exposed, unlike the Pharisees, we return hate, we will return grace and peace to the people around us. It is being captured by Jesus that will truly and only allow us to experience the presence and the rule of God. Now I know, family, emotionally we don't always think this. Emotionally we don't always experience this, but this is why we remind one another. This is why we read His Word, and this is why we spend extended times in prayer with God. And so we don't have time to get into that this morning. How when we pray, we come into God's presence, we actually do business with God. And that's why we're going into the series. Prayers for Pretoria. Prayers for our own hearts to connect and make sure that we realize that it's only through Jesus that we get to experience the good rule and good presence of God in our lives. Family, I hope that this is true for us not only this morning but throughout this time where we might be separated from one another, where we even feel emotionally separated from one another, that we realize that in the same way that Christ was with Stephen until his dying moments, that he is with us wherever we are and whatever we are experiencing. And he is serious about blessing us and loving us and forgiving us. Let's give honor and praise to him. Amen. Father God, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for this mammoth exposition of Old Testament history pointing and elevating and glorifying the main character of all history, Jesus Christ. 
we pray that we won't somehow hold into other ideas, superstition, illusions, something else that we need to do to feel or experience you, but that we would recognize the price that has been paid on the cross and that you have already accepted us, that you are eager to forgive us. Father, I pray that as we are changed by you, that we would, similar to Stephen, be cut. When we are cut, that we would bleed grace and forgiveness. Father, may we be a different people, that from the outside we might look the same. But especially in times of crisis, when everything else is stripped away, when our gods are exposed, that our God would be Jesus Christ standing next to the one true God. That we would see that and be encouraged by that. And that we would be able to love and serve the broken world around us. We can only do this through your grace. And you give it to us freely and willingly. For that we love you and we praise you. Amen.